Thank you very much for the three presentations. It's now time for questions. Questions, if you have any questions. We've had three very different presentations covering a variety of areas and topics from a policy paper to secondary data and to an RCT. So there must be John Rand has a question or two. Um, I came in a little bit late, so I only have a question for Elizabeth. Um, you don't talk so much about whether there are differences in nutritional values of the two uh, crops. Uh, that's just the first question, whether there might be a nutritional effect. We have seen that uh, when we introduce these high uh, or new technology crops that are gene modified, and sometimes the, uh, the composition of nutrition is different. So if you could comment on that. And then I'm a little bit uh, unsure how you did the randomization, because I guess that uh, some of the villages that you select uh, have a higher likelihood of flooding than others. So have you control for, for example, the greenness uh, index from the NASA data in the estimation, and how will that affect your result if you have different uh, t uh, soil types and maybe correlated village effects that is related to that question? Thank you. Thank you. We have down at the final row. Yes, sorry. Uh, thank you so much. That's the question to Alain de Javry. Uh, uh, the positive effects of certification of the property rights on land, these positive effects, they probably depend on the initial distribution of land. I, I'm not an agriculture economist, but I think in your previous papers, you show that even distribution of land uh, creates uh, more positive effects uh, uh, than uh, in the situation of uneven distribution of the large land ownership concentration of land. Now, uh, do we have this evidence, or uh, there is no evidence like that? Thank you. Thank you. We take one more question here in the front. Hi, I'm Tanya Pan Sankratang from Chulalongkorn University, Thailand. Um, um, it's a question for Alan. Um, you mentioned that you see the heterogeneity in the migrants, but in terms of um, the size of the farm that they migrated from, um, provided that you have census data, I'm just wondering whether you see heterogeneity in terms of age, like um, who actually migrate, whether it's the younger ones or the elderly one, because in Thailand, now we have a lot of migration from rural areas, and those who are left in farms are um, elderly farmers, and now the average age of the farmers are about um, 53 years old. It just could be a knock-on effect on productivity as well. I think. Thank you very much. Before I let you answer, David, is infrastructure and agricultural or non-agricultural support policy? You can think about that. Uh, Betty? Uh, your question on the on the Swana Sobwan. So this is uh, relatively. Let's try again. Uh, on your question about the quality of that new seed, Swana Sub 1, well, in this case, it, it turned out, I know it's not always the case, it turns out that uh, Swana Sub 1 is really exactly the same seed as Swana, except just one gene. So there is no, uh, there's no difference, neither in nutrition nor a lot of, none of the other uh, quality response to input. So that was also very easy for the farmers to adopt it very quickly because exactly could treat it exactly the same way. Uh, so that's, there is no negative uh, effect on that. In terms of the randomization, so um, we randomized the, so we started with 128 villages, which were all considered to be similar in terms of their ex ante risk. And, and then we randomized 64 out of these uh, 128, verify some of these uh, 
normal randomization check that we had. But uh, more importantly, because this is not such a large number, in terms of plots, it's very large numbers. So we do, we have a lot of robustness tests test in which we introduce all the characteristics of the plots that we have, and we verify those results on the plots at that time. So the, the, the behavior is at the level of the farmer. So in that, among the farmers, we have a really large number of farmers. Uh, and then for verification of the, on the yield, we introduce also the, the characteristic of the plots. So the uh, initial conditions clearly important. In that case, the uh, initial uh, distribution is quite equal within a particular community. Uh, so we see that there is land concentration. We see that there is more migration from the smaller farmers. So we can expect that land concentration is towards those who initially have more land, even though the uh, inequality in land distribution is not very large. So one of the policy implications, in a sense, of this is to say, well, there, there is going to be land concentration. Does it have to be towards the larger farmers? Or could there be assistance given to smaller farmers to be competitive on the land rental market in this case, which is whereby the uh, land is concentrating? Right? In terms of migration, I think the question is, is, uh, is relevant. We have not looked carefully as to who migrates. We know there is more migration of small than larger farmers. There's more migration from the worst areas as opposed to the better areas. Do we, in this case, the migration is really family labor that was staying on the land that could be relocated to off-farm activities. It's not so much full family migrations as to migration of, of members, right? Here as well, in terms of police implication, one could say, well, if you are going to do something which is going to induce migration, why don't you help people be better prepared to migrate? So they have a better chance to f inserting themselves in those labor markets, which are quite different from the ones in which they are performing bef before with more success. Right? So point well taken, we should look in more detail. And one of the policy implications here would be if we know better who differentially is going to migrate by gender and, and age, whether something can be done at the same time as you do land certification and titling to help the migratory process be more successful. Now to the question of whether um, infrastructure is an agriculture or non-agricultural support policy. Um, I think this is where it's hard to separate the two uh, in, in many ways, but um, yeah, I think it helps both. Um, but first, if you think of, of rural feeder roads, for example, um, improved infrastructure then reduces the cost to uh, acquiring the inputs uh, at the uh, local market. Right, so that, that would be one way of, uh, of thinking of it as a, um, as a support for agriculture. Uh, but it also uh, improves opportunities for traders, right? And so that's, these are the types of policies that, uh, well, they help uh, farmers, but also uh, help, uh, help the non-farm uh, as well. And these are the types of policies that um, uh, have those spillovers. Thanks. Thank you. We have time for another round. I think right in the corner, down there, uh, the microphone and then yes. yes thank you my name is Tang from uh, Ice Pond, uh, Vietnam uh, my question is to Mr. Alan um, in Vietnam uh, we also uh, doing the land uh, um, certification to the household and uh, uh, our system is uh, a little bit different that uh, the land is um, how to say uh, state owned so the household will have only the right to use. Um, and uh, when the state, the government take the land back for some uh, construction like a road or uh, industrial zones, uh, there, there are lots of uh, disputes uh, between the government and the farmers, the household. I do have the same uh, issue in Mexico. And uh, if you have how to resolve this problem, uh, when the government uh, compensate to the, the farmer, how do you uh, do it uh, and how do you set the price that would be acceptable for both for government and for the farmers? Thank you. Uh, I'm Saurabh from UNU Widers, so just a quick 
question on the last uh, paper. I was uh, wondering that you mentioned that this flooding was uh, one of uh, uh, one of the worst in uh, recent years. So, what was the state response to this flood, and uh, do you know if this varied between your treatment and control villages? The lady in front. Hi, uh, I'm Ngoc from um, World Bank slash University of Chicago. Um, I have a question for Alan. Um, so I was wondering uh, if you, um, so, so I think the, the land certification program probably happened um, at a time where you also see some increase in manufacturing jobs in Mexico. Um, so I was wondering how you would be able to um, separate the effects of um, the separate effects on migration that that could um, stem from the certification program um, and you know available jobs in manufacturing in the area. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. While you answer this half. Okay, uh, I was hoping the question from Vietnam, so thank you, because I have been trying to answer it in my mind as, since we have arrived here. It's quite interesting in a sense that there are three kinds of threats to uh, land security, right? What, when you do not have titles to the land. The, the first one is the threat of invasion by others. There is a famous work by Erika Fields that uh, has served as a benchmark for a lot of the studies on the land insecurity, which is that the neighbors could invade and take over your land. And so if you have the use right but not the property right, then you are going to make sure that there is someone on the land, someone in the property, to fend off the possibility of invasions by others. Right? We are not really talking about these kind of things here. We are talking about the second situation where the threat like in Ethiopia, like in China, like in Mexico, was the community that would reallocate the land to, some, to someone else in the community. So there's no threat on the part of the state, but the threat is that the community might decide that if you are underusing or misusing the land, someone is going to be nominated to replace you and you're going to be kicked out of, of, of the land, right? That's the situation that prevails in Mexico. That's the one that prevails in, in in uh, Ethiopia. And in China, there's still the situation where th when the village leaders see people migrating and making underuse of the land, and there's there are local people who could make better use of the land, there could be relocation to them, right? So that's the kind of threat which, are be which is being analyzed here. The third kind of threat is the one which is currently relevant in Vietnam and is also quite relevant in China, is when the state is going to expropriate land, not to give it to other farmers, but to transform the land into urban property or to, tr to allocate the land to industrial development, right? And here there are basically two kinds of situations. One is if, if you don't have title, then in a sense the local authorities have a very strong handle over you. And even though if you had title, there could be a call on eminent domain and you could in fact be expropriated, the fact that you don't have title puts you in a very weak position in terms of your bargaining capacity towards the state when the local officials of the central government want to expropriate the land to shift land use towards other, other uses, right? The Mexican case is not that one. The, the community has jurisdiction of the, over the land and the government could not expropriate the land from the community to be allocated to elsewhere, right? The key, I think, in, in, in Vietnam, which is the, uh, the subject of debate now, is that if you would go to formal full titling, then would compensation be different because you would have more bargaining power than the uh, current situation whereby you are quite subjected to local abuse because you don't have much of a jurisdiction over the land. And that's where the final titling is really an important issue. Now, the land would still be subjected to eminent domain, namely if there is an urgency, there's a railroad or a freeway, or there's a, an industrial plant which is going to be located here, you are not going to be able to resist expropriation. However, the bargaining position that you have having full title is going to be different from the one where, uh, which currently prevails in Vietnam. The, the other uh, thing in terms of what's happening else, surely there was uh, industrialization and urban job creation, there was NAFTA, there were other things. Remember here we have a natural experiment. So we have the equivalent in, an, in a natural fashion to a randomized controlled trial here where what we do, and this is where we look at those parallel trends, we tend to we establish statistically before we use the non-treated as a counterfactual to the treated to make sure that there is no bias in the way in which the rollout of the program has been implemented. So that gives us 
like in a randomized control trial, control over exogenous other phenomena, such as industrial employment uh, in, across the communities. And we have time fixed defect as well, so we, we have annual fixed defects. Uh, so the question, the question was whether there were, uh, in this case, uh, flooding where there was state response. In Orissa, uh, not much, or probably not at all, actually. Uh, because I think that even in the major storm that came since, which were last year after our experiment, I don't think there has been much state coming uh, in to help uh, uh, anyway. Um, now, what's happening with flooding is that uh, even, even when you have large flood, you have large heterogeneity in flooding, even within a village. Because right? this is a flooding that comes from river that, uh, over, uh, that, that overflows their, their, their bed. So it's, it's, not, it's not a flooding that comes from rain as, as much as it comes from river. And therefore, you have in all the villages, you have areas which are flooded for more days, areas which are not flooded. So it's very heterogeneous. And, and there is no sort, it's not like a, a, massive, um, a, ma a massive exogenous shock that would have affected the whole area together. Uh, and probably less prone to help from the government, I guess, because it's more specific to different farmers. But regardless of the, the way it happened, uh, there was no state response to that flooding. Thank you very much. And I think we should thank the speakers. And